in, in the movies, put self and pleasure first. They don't put love and, and consequences first. They don't consider the consequences of actions or care upon, about the effects that they have on others. They're just going to do what feels good right now for them, never realizing what they're going to wake up to, never realizing what the consequences of their behavior is going to be. 22 says, plans fail for lack of counsel. With many advisors, they succeed. And I put counseling of Asian kids up there because, you know, Asian kids are really smart. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why I did that. Goals are met when plans are submitted to the wisdom of others. We need help from other people. We need their input. We need their advice. Now, it's not saying uh, others can spot flaws that, that we can't. They see things differently, and sometimes we get so blind, and sometimes we get so caught up that we, we don't uh, find out uh, where the flaw is. And this is, the point is not that, that we gather so many opinions around us, you know, and we never make a choice, but it is to say, let others help you. Get advice from some. You don't need a, a whole slew of advisors, but submit your plans to at least one other person, and so you can figure out what's going on. A man finds joy in giving an apt reply, and how good is a timely word. This verse may also say, some find joy in the answer of their own mouths. It's a kind of a tricky one to translate in Hebrew. And, it's just, and that would, then it would be describing people who just like to hear themselves talk. By contrast, a timely word is one that is considered. It's one that comes from outside your own perspective. It's that opposite of, you know, of no advice. And it is desirable to have that kind of answer. The proverb celebrates the fact that wisdom knows how to speak, and it's the right word at the right time. We understand that proverb, the right word at the right time. Well, the wise person knows that kind of word. Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 3 uh, says, there is a time to be silent and a time to speak. And we have to understand those times. When is the right time to say something and when is the right time to be quiet? Verse 24 says, the path of life leads upward and the wise, for the wise to keep him from going down to the grave. Well, a stairway goes both ways. If you turn around and go back down the stairs, it says you're going down to the grave. But you can also go on the way up and keep you from going uh, down to the grave. Here's another path saying. There's a lot of path sayings in the book of Proverbs, and they're clustered around uh, these verses here in chapter 15. The downward path goes in the opposite direction of the path of life, and it ends up in the, uh, the NIV translates it grave, but it's the Hebrew word for hell or uh, the Hebrew word is actually Sheol, but, uh, and here they translated it grave, and the reason for that is because it doesn't necessarily referencing heaven and, and the afterlife so much as it's going to bring you an early end. You know, your life is going to run out because you're not using the words that you want correctly, or you're not following the path that you should correctly. The most basic contrast of the proverb is actually seen here. It's the ends towards which our lives are headed. Are we headed towards heaven or are we headed towards hell? Are we headed towards an untimely death or are we headed for a long life? In fact, that would be the, actually more apt in Proverbs because Proverbs talks most about this life. You know, which way are we going to end up traveling? And then the last verses in, in this section in the book of Proverbs have a lot of, of God sayings. The Lord says this or the Lord says that or the Lord thinks this. This section is tied together with all of those Lord sayings. The Lord tears down the proud, the proud man's house, but he keeps the widow's boundaries intact. He is going to tear down those people who despise him, but he is going to protect those people who love him. And in, in a lot of times in the Old Testament and Proverbs, the, the proud are oftentimes the rich, and the widow uh, are oftentimes the righteous. Contrast is between the house of the proud and the fields of the poor. The moved boundary marker comes to stand for all kinds of injustice against a, an, a weaker person. In the Old Testament, again, not a lot of laws, not a lot of, of ways of enforcing the laws. And, the way, and, and not, you know, they didn't have boundaries and fences and all those kinds of good things. They were still working that out. And so they would pile stones, and there's a pile of stones in the middle of that picture with the arrow pointing at it. Uh, and it, it is a boundary marker. And they would say, this is my field, here are the boundaries of my field, and they would put uh, boundary stones there. Well, hey, let's go out in the middle of the night and move those. 
I just needed this a little bit. And, you know, and go shove them over there. I don't want to take all of their land. I just want a little bit. But God makes sure that that boundary stone will continue where it is. Like that boundary stone, they made a wall solidifying that thing. Well, God says he will take care of the poor. He will make sure that the, that the poor people get the justice that, is, that, that they deserve. It is a wise, is the wise way of life that leads upward, but the proud uh, way of lifted hearts and lifted eyes. The Lord detests the thoughts of the wicked, but those of the pure are pleasing to him. The theme is, again, opposite of those, uh, opposition uh, of God to those who turn away from him. He loves everyone, but on the other hand, they don't love him, and so he has to respond in justice to that uh, choice. God finds the thoughts of the wicked to be a detestable abomination. I put up Mr. Darcy up there because he's looking at, at, at Elizabeth in ways that he shouldn't. Uh, I think there's lust in his heart. Any big Darcy fans out there? <laughs> no. I am really out to lunch today. Uh, now, read alongside verse 25, this saying highlights God's looking at the intentions that motivate right and wrong behavior. Okay, so it's saying, yeah, people, God hates people who, who do things that are wrong, but he also looks at the intentions as well. And he says, I understand the intentions. Human beings don't understand intentions. You know, Beth was screaming at a ref the other day. You saw him. He intended to hit that person. <laughs> I'm going, Beth, you just said you can't judge intentions. Well, yeah, but it's them. Uh, <laughs> she intended well. <laughs> we, can't judge inten- we can't judge intentions. But God can. He sees the heart. A negative example follows in, in verse 27 um, and in, in 317. Well, it follows verse 27. It goes all the way back to 317. Wisdom's ways are pleasing or pleasant. And it tells us that we need to be, to be good. In verse 27, it says, A greedy man brings trouble to his family, but he who hates bribes will live. That child has been bribed, and they're going to have a short life because they're getting way too much sugar. Um, that's the segue I made with that picture. A, a bribe is a horrible thing. A gift is not a bad thing, but a bribe that where you change your mind uh, and do something for money is not a good thing. The greedy person thinks only of the gains, never of the consequences. A wise person will look at the consequences. The bribe or gift plays on this desire for power. What do you want out of life? Do you want power and are you willing to just do anything to get it? And the Proverbs tell us that pr- bribes, doing things and taking money just to get power, is an evil thing. You can choose to hate the bride, the bribe, or you can choose to hate your family. Uh, which, uh, if you love bribes and you love doing things just for, for ignoring the consequences, you will hate your own house. Verse 28 says, The heart of the righteous weighs its answers, but the mouth of the wicked gushes evil. Verses 28 and 29 form a, a pair of wicked righteous contrasts, and they are paired together to show us that. The first compares the foresight of those people who are wise and of the righteous heart that weighs its answers and it has an internal standard by which it knows what's right and wrong against that impulsive speech of the wicked who just gushes forth like a broken dam. The wicked just don't even think about what they're going to say. They just say it. But the righteous will think about what answer will get them the results that they want. What answer, what statement will have the best consequences for their family, for themselves. And so uh, they, are, they are considered wise. When the inner work of the mouth is ignored, of the heart is ignored, the mouth just pours out folly. We have to have our hearts trained and we have to listen to our hearts. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. Um, you don't have to yell at God. <laughs> I wasn't sure what I was doing with that one either. Verse 29 turns its attention from the working of the righteous and wicked hearts to God's response. Okay, we've talked about what we're supposed to do. Now we find out what God is going to do in response to either our bad choices or our bad intentions or our good choices and our, and our good intentions. Far is not so much a matter of distance. It is a matter of attitude. It's a matter of choice. They are far from God and God is far from them because they choose to be far from God. They choose not to listen to what God has to say. 
The prayer of the righteous drives the point home, since the reader assumes that the wicked don't even 